The humerus is the bone of the arm. It is the largest bone in the upper limb. It articulates with the scapula at the glenohumeral or shoulder joint, and it articulates with the radius and ulna at the elbow joint. The humerus is a long bone, thus it has a shaft and two distended ends. The proximal end has a head, surgical and anatomical necks, and greater and lesser tubercles or tuberosities. The spherical head of the humerus articulates with the glenoid fossa of the scapula. The anatomical neck is formed by the groove circumscribing the head and separating it from the remaining part of the proximal end, that's to say, the greater and lesser tubercles. The anatomical neck indicates the line of attachment of the capsule of the shoulder joint. The surgical neck is the narrow part that is located at the junction of the expanded upper end and the shaft. The surgical neck is a common site of fracture, hence the name. The axillary nerve winds around behind the surgical neck accompanied by the posterior circumflex humeral vessels. The head forms about one third of a sphere and its area is much larger than that of the glenoid cavity of the scapula with which it articulates. The glenoid cavity is shallow, concave and oval. There is a marked disproportion between the large head of the humerus, the bowl, and the small shallow glenoid fossa, the socket, which only accepts about one third of the humeral head. The shoulder joint is therefore very mobile, but easily dislocated. Stability of a joint is usually inversely related to mobility. The capsule of the shoulder joint is attached to the anatomical neck, except medially, where it extends downward for about 2 cm on the medial side. The greater and lesser tubercles or tuberosities provide attachment to some scapulohumeral muscles. The greater tubercle is at the lateral margin of the humerus, whereas the lesser tubercle projects anteriorly from the bone. The intertubercular sulcus, or bicipital groove, separates the tubercles. It's called bicipital groove because it provides a protected passage for the slender tendon of the long head of biceps muscle. The long head of biceps arises from the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula within the capsule of the shoulder joint. The greater tubercle has three smooth facets for the insertion of scapular rotator cuff muscles. Superiorly is the facet for supraspinatus, behind this the facet for infraspinatus, while posteriorly the lowest facet receives teres minor muscle. The lesser tubercle carries a facet for the attachment of the fourth and last of the rotator cuff muscles, and this is subscapularis. The greater tubercle extends down as the lateral lip of the intertubercular groove. The lateral lip of the intertubercular groove receives the attachment of pectoralis major. The lesser tubercle extends down as the medial lip of the intertubercular groove, which receives the attachment of teres major. The ribbon-like twisted tendon of latissimus dorsi is received in the floor of the intertubercular groove. The upper part of the groove is bridged by the transverse ligament, which converts the groove into a tunnel for the exit of the tendon of the long head of biceps from inside the capsule of the shoulder joint. The shaft has two prominent features, posteriorly the radial groove and laterally the deltoid tuberosity. The deltoid tuberosity is at the middle of the lateral side of the shaft. It is V-shaped with a smaller ridge in between. The deltoid tuberosity provides attachment for the deltoid muscle. The radial groove spirals down the posterior surface, hence it's also called the spiral groove. It is named radial because the radial nerve and profunda brachii vessels lie in the groove during their passage between the medial and lateral heads of triceps brachii muscle. The inferior end of the humeral shaft widens and becomes flattened. The medial and lateral supracondylar ridges form and then end distally in the prominent medial epicondyle and the less prominent lateral epicondyle. The supracondylar ridges provide attachment for the medial and lateral intermuscular septa. This is the site of the lateral intermuscular septum, 
and it is attached to the lateral supracondylar ridge. The lateral and medial intermuscular septa divide the arm into anterior and posterior compartments. In addition to the lateral intermuscular septum, the lateral supracondylar ridge provides attachment for two muscles of the forearm. These are brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus. Level with the lower part of the deltoid tuberosity, a nutrient foramen is located anterior to the medial border and is directed down toward the elbow. To the elbow I go, from the knee I flee, summarizes the direction of nutrient foramina in the long bones of the upper and lower limbs. The nutrient artery of the humerus arises around the middle of the arm as a branch of the brachial artery and enters the nutrient canal of the humerus. This canal and those in the bones of the forearm run towards the elbow joint. To the elbow I go, from the knee I flee. The nutrient artery in general is directed away from the growing end of the long bone. The growing end of limb bones is the end at which most of the growth takes place. So the nutrient artery is directed away from the growing end, which is therefore the proximal end of the humerus in this case. Above this foramen and opposite the deltoid tuberosity, coracobrachialis muscle is inserted. Note that coracobrachialis is attached to the coracoid process proximally and to the humerus distally, hence the name coracobrachialis, indicating the extent of the muscle. The anterior or flexor surface of the lower part of the humerus provides attachment for brachialis. Here, brachialis is covered with biceps. In this plastic model, biceps is removed from the front of brachialis. Thus, we can see the full extent of brachialis. Note that the musculocutaneous nerve is sandwiched between biceps and brachialis, and thus, it is not in direct contact with the humerus. Unlike some other nerves, such as the axillary nerve, which has been mentioned, and this lies in contact with the surgical neck of the humerus. Thus, injury of musculocutaneous nerve is less likely to complicate humeral fractures. Posteriorly, the shaft gives attachment to the lateral and medial heads of triceps muscle, above and below the spiral groove consecutively. The long head of triceps arises from the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula and is not attached to the humerus. The medial and lateral epicondyles are subcutaneous and easily palpated on the medial and lateral aspects of the elbow region. The knob-like medial epicondyle, as you can see here, is more prominent than the lateral. The medial and lateral epicondyles provide attachment of muscles of the flexor and extensor compartments of the forearm. The anterior surface of the medial epicondyle provides a common origin of the superficial muscles of the flexor compartment, namely pronate arteries, flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor digitorum superficialis, palmaris longus, and flexor carpi ulnaris. Inflammation of this common flexor origin results in a painful elbow condition called golfer's elbow. The smooth area on the front of the lateral epicondyle is for the attachment of the common extensor origin. From it arise the fused tendons of extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor digitorum, extensor digiti minimi, and extensor carpi ulnaris. Tennis elbow is an inflammation of the common extensor origin due to their overuse. The distal end of the humerus, including the trochlea, capitulum, olecranon, coronoid, and radial fossae makes up the condyle of the humerus. The condyle has two articular surfaces, a lateral capitulum, which means little head, and is a section of a sphere for articulation with the head of the radius. The capitulum is not visible on the posterior surface. Medially, the trochlea, which means pulley, is for articulation with the trochlear notch of the ulna. The trochlea can be seen on the anterior and posterior surfaces of the humerus, unlike the capitulum, which is only seen anteriorly. The medial part of the trochlea is at a more distal level than the capitulum, which is a causative factor for the carrying angle at the elbow.
when the forearm is in the anatomical position, that's to say extended and supinated, the arm and forearm are not in the same line. The forearm is directed laterally, forming a carrying angle between the axis of a radially deviated forearm and the axis of the humerus. Normally, the carrying angle is 5 to 15 degrees away from the body. The carrying angle allows the extended forearm to clear away from the side of the hip during swinging of the upper limb and while carrying loads, hence the name carrying angle. Two hollows or fossae occur back to back superior to the trochlea, making the condyle quite thin between the epicondyles. Sometimes the bone is absent and an olecranon foramen is present. Anteriorly, the coronoid fossa receives the coronoid process of the ulna during full flexion of the elbow. Posteriorly, the olecranon fossa accommodates the olecranon of the ulna during full extension of the elbow. Superior to the capitulum, anteriorly, a shallower distal fossa accommodates the edge of the head of the radius when the forearm is fully flexed. The capsule of the elbow joint is attached to the margins of the trochlea and the capitulum. The capsule is also attached to the humerus above the coronoid and radial fossae. Posteriorly, the capsule includes the olecranon fossa inside it. The following parts of the humerus are in direct contact with nerves. The surgical neck of the humerus is related to the axillary nerve. The radial or spiral groove is related to the radial nerve. The distal end of the humerus is related anteriorly to the median nerve. The medial epicondyle of the humerus is related posteriorly to the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve can cause an electric shock-like sensation by striking the medial epicondyle of the humerus from posteriorly. Remember the prominence of the medial epicondyle. The ulnar nerve is trapped between the bone and the overlying skin at this point. This peculiar sensation experienced when it is struck is commonly referred to as bumping one's funny bone. This name is also thought to be a pun based on the sound resemblance between the name of the humerus and the word humerus, meaning funny.